Welcome to a new episode of No Secret Source Podcast. My guest today is Anthony. Anthony is someone I've personally known for the past five years and I've met while doing BJJ. He is also a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner and he currently holds a purple belt. He helped me grow my skills in BJJ and influenced my journey with his unique style. For those of you who don't know, the purple belt in BJJ is the second belt that you get awarded after, on average, four to five years of consistent training. Anthony is a proud father of three, and he's also a biology teacher with nearly two decades of experience. In today's episode, we will discuss about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Anthony's journey into the sport, how he's currently battling an Achilles tendon injury that he suffered while playing basketball. We will touch upon his journey as a teacher and we will discuss interesting learning and teaching concepts. We will also find out how you can get started on a journey as a teacher. And now for my discussion with Anthony. Anthony. (laughs) Welcome to the show, man. Thank you, you for having me. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm all good, man. Glad to be here. Glad to see you again after your injury. Yeah. Tough time. Tough time. Um, won't say BJJ killer just yet, but... Gentle BJJ Gen- killer, man. <laughs> you're, you're, honestly, you and I think Nick, in my opinion, are the people that once you roll with your whole game needs to evolve and needs to change because you realize how many layers are to this game is ridiculous. The, your, your game as a jiu-jitsu player is so incredible. It's so gentle and yet deadly. It is deadly. I appreciate that. But um, you also, I saw, you know, before you got your blue belt, your game also raised. And I think that then made sent me home to do more homework. Thanks, man. And then so... It's, I think everyone's just feeding, you know, you hear this a lot, but everyone's just feeding off each other. Yeah. And then now there's like you pushing everyone, um, Medi and Daz, everyone, everyone comes now and does, and Alex as well. Everyone does their bit of research, everyone steps up, up and then all of a sudden up, the, the moves don't work anymore. So you've got to go back. And it shocks me because I noticed like you'll get me on neon belly a couple of times. And then all of a sudden I'm like, where's this come from? Yeah. And so now I've got to go home and be like, right. I can't let Charlie do this to me again. I've got to research all sorts. So I think that's, I think we're all just helping each other and it's been good. Like, I still feel like a purple, but a, a blue belt at heart though. I feel like we're, you're always... The belt says says something else. Yeah. You're purple, man. You're purple. I'll take that. You deserve it. You you have it. I really think you, you know, you, you've been doing it for a long time now and, and you can see your game has changed so much, especially since, because... Let's be honest, the, the cough cough situation has slowed a lot of us down, right? When mm. we, we couldn't train for, what's that, nearly a year, right? I would have done it though. If I'd have known people were doing it, I would have. Yeah, we're still them. doing it. Yeah, yeah, some people were secretly, and if I'd have known, I would have joined them. But yeah, that, it would have, to be honest, I was tempted as well. At times, I was tempted. And still at the same time, I, I think looking back now, I think I should have done it. I should have just trained and. You know, just do something with someone and, you know. Create a bubble or something. Yeah. Or whatever it is, just something. Because it a long time. not doing anything, right? We didn't know, did we? No one knew what was going on. That That was the situation. Now, we just need to look forward and and train hard and catch up with the wasted time. That's it. (laughs) Right. And that's, yeah. And with my injury, it's a bit frustrating because I feel like that's, you know, COVID was a wasted time. And now this injury feels like... I was saying to you earlier, 120 days yeah, to yeah, that's kick off. Crazy, that's a crazy injury. So That's uh, a very unexpected, right? You said you, you got injured playing basketball, right? Yes, yeah. So I wasn't anything. It was half-time playing staff versus students at my school. Just went down to my left to grab the ball. Felt like I rolled my ankle. In honesty, I, uh, I think I knew I'd done my Achilles because I'd heard enough about it, you know, from other people. Um... I hobbled off at half time, continued teaching in the afternoon, drove home, which was painful. Like pressing down on the clutch was just horrendous. And then uh, in the morning, I tried to get out of bed and walk and I just couldn't. So I was like... So you knew. I knew. That's it. 
and then so they go and you go to the hospital they do something called thompson's test where they squeeze they you, you kneel down and they squeeze your calf muscle and your foot moves so my good foot was just moving did it to the bad one nothing nothing and they were like yeah achilles straight away and so um there's uh, a tear um and so I, I had the boot on for a month and it'll be on with, for another month still but had to keep it at 30 degrees plantar fe- flexion yeah uh, just to allow the two ends to heal because i'm going non non-surgery i think if i was going surgery i'd have been even more down in the dumps but yeah so yeah. it's a rough one it is rough well other than you know being out of training how did the injury affect your private life and i think i was a bit grumbly like, yeah. uh for, fortunately i was on the easter holidays okay so it didn't affect the um work too much um but at home yes you feel down and like you know i love doing jiu-jitsu and that feels like my one activity go and see mark and you guys and train and learn and you know work out each other's moves and without that i was and it felt so far away as well and there was no clear guidelines yeah one was saying to me okay this week the doctor's gonna see you next week you'll do the scan following week you'll do this it's not like you have a progress bar where you see it's loading and yeah hey, i'm 10 percent in exactly and i think it's none of that if they'd given that to me they give you a little schedule but i but you have to do your own research basically and if you go out there there's lots of youtubers who have done like week by week tracking their um progression in the more and there's a facebook group so i, I sort of haven't been on facebook for a while and then i found a facebook group and that's got so much information in um, and people give you plans and but I didn't get that until you know a month in so but that's the way with anything isn't it the more you start to study this more you find out and you're like oh yeah. that'd have been useful the same as jiu-jitsu like exactly yeah the more you study it the more you're like oh that'd have been useful a month ago when someone was choking me out or tapping yeah. me out so but at the same time I think with your injury the more you look into your problem while you have it you might get into that moment where you're like you feel down and there's so many bad things going on out there so so many complications and you might look at it and you think oh am i going to be like that am i going to be taking longer and then you're going to be over uh, careful with stuff 100 percent. there was um so there's something you can do where you can the the tendon can heal short which is what you want or heal long yeah and it's just to do if, if you don't keep your foot at that position if it heals long you lose that explosiveness so you'll you might limp or struggle walking but again you would just doing a little jump might be challenging so i'm terrified of that and like you say on facebook there's hundreds of people who and that's where they're going to go and share their hot nightmare stories so in the back of your head you're like oh no exactly. what's happening here exactly it messes up with you even yeah. for me when i when i go on google and i search i've got a, a random headache i didn't feel it before going from there and, in, and i look on it and there's some bad results and i'm thinking yeah, it's, you've got to be careful with that. <laughs> Google doctors, you've got to be careful with that stuff. It's dangerous. It gets you in a bad, bad place, right? Yeah. You definitely don't want that while you're healing from any sort of injury, right? Because you, you need to be in a in a good state of mind yeah. to get past it. So maybe you do need that time just to like... Yeah. But I think the matter, when it, when something gets taken away from you, because I, I can't, you know, I couldn't drive before. Um, yeah, it takes away your freedoms and your your, your outlet. And jiu-jitsu was my, out, you know, my outlet. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I've been a bit grumpy, but I'm getting better, I think. Like, no. I'm starting to turn a corner, a real corner. Have you got any pain or the pain is so... No, going so away now? I've been so lucky. I've probably taken ibuprofen twice during the whole time so far. Um, the first night, um, and then I had an achy night. Every time you, you get to change the angle in this boot, yeah, and every time you do it, it, your ankle starts to swell up a little bit because it just hasn't moved that range of movement. And then, um, so I've, and I, yeah, it was sore, so I took another ibuprofen. But so I've been fortunate like that because I've heard stories where people are saying it aches all the time, they can't sleep. Because I have to sleep with the boot on as well, which is a bit awkward. But um, fortunately, I've no pain. So that's been a good thing. Are you ready for the, for the, for the recovery afterwards when you need to go and see the physiotherapy and uh, to do yeah, some of the exercises where going through all that pain of naturally be. In the yeah, muscles. the atrophy is wild straight away. Within a week, you yeah. notice one your calf muscles, and I'm not the biggest calf anyway. But um, yeah, that's going to be tough work. But I'm gonna, that's going to be. I've got jujitsu in the back of my mind as like a goal to get back to. So if they say you've got to do this many acts, as long as they tell me what exercise I've got to do, I'm just going to do it. Like 
if I'm a, if I'm school teaching and I need to stand up and do calf raises, I'll do it while I'm teaching. Yeah. Do you know, wherever it is, yeah. you know, I'll just incorporate it and just get on. But um, if, as long as I know it's helping me get back to where I want to be, yeah, I'm going to sort of, but it's, I know it's going to be tough as well because yeah. even like trying to, you know, ex, you know, push on a resistance band with my foot because I've done right. a little bit is you've you got no strength. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it'll be a long road, but like I say, if I know I've got jujitsu to go back, get back to. Do you have a goal in mind? So at least you know what you're looking forward to, right? Yeah. And then you just have to come back to it and, and do what you got to do at the end of the day. Just. Yeah, I think it's so true. Yeah. I've been like, since it happened, I think I created a little timeline and it's up on our sort of radiator yeah. on the wall. Um, and every, every week there's a little milestone to get to. So whether it's changing the angle on the boot, seeing my physio for the first time, I put these little stars in on the on the sort of calendar. That's great, yeah. And just like, so it gives me a little, I don't know if it's like a Things dopamine to hit. Forward to yeah. it. You know what to expect in the future, so you get everything planned out. That's that's a very good way and, to do it, yeah. And so like, yeah, so, you know, driving again, that was a little goal. Um, changing the angle, anything like that, I just put it in and I'm like, okay, I can get to it. Um, and then I'm really looking forward to removing the boot in just under a month or fingers. So, lots of fingers, man. That's it. Let's let's hope he gets he gets healed properly Thank and gets you very much. quickly. Thank you. We we'll get you back at jiu-jitsu real soon. And that's the other thing is I feel like I'm slipping behind as well. Like I see all the pictures man. on the WhatsApp group. I'm like, and I know you guys are already rising, and so I'm just like, oh gosh, where am I going to be when I slot back in? Like, I just been away for two weeks on holiday. Looking back at it, you see the pictures, and you you think in your back. I think it's that competitive aspect to it as yeah. well. They look back and you think, ah, oh, these guys are getting ahead of me. They're training more than me. I don't know if everyone's the same, but I, I look at it that way. Then all these hours, all these rounds, I'm not there to train. They have the the edge, right? Yeah. And I think they, I think it is something there. Like I think you, you know, you won't go back to being novice, but there will be, there will be a difference. And I'm there are people I've already sort of looked at. I've seen who trained every every week, and I'm like, they're not going to be the same when they come back. Yeah. So I've got to be... You need to be ready, yeah. And ready. You need to be ready, man. It's, there's killers out there, man. Them them guys, they train hard. They train hard, especially with the, with the catch coming in. Yeah. It's just the whole club has changed. It's, it's crazy. And there's, yeah, just a lot of cross-training. Um, and it's exciting as well when you see a couple of new white belts in there. You're like, oh, okay, what are they like? Are they wild? Are they, you know... So um, yeah, just trying to push forward with that at the moment. That's good, man. Yeah. But let me let me ask you this, right? Because I, I I honestly, since I know you, we always spend the time. We always had a chat. We always talked about Jiu Jitsu and, and yeah. things like this. But I never had a chance to ask about you. Like, who is Anthony? Who is he? What uh, do you do for a living? Uh, so I'm a teacher. Teach biology at a school in Isha. Um, been doing that for 15 years. 16 years maybe um i'm a father three husbands um and jujitsu play i think that's my, my my job my home and my you know my my passion on the side yeah. um enjoy music um movies t uh tv um bit of basketball enjoy it to my <laughs> day unless he uh, ends up with won't be playing anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to be a bit of a rugby player, not a very good standard, but I think that's why I enjoy the jiu-jitsu again, is um, there's that contact. Yeah. I think that's so important. And like, um, it's one thing I know when people join, sorry to break about jiu-jitsu, okay. when people start jiu-jitsu, they're afraid of that distance and that contact. Yeah. And then what you notice is after a while, people start to be like, oh, I can, it's all right to be that close to someone else. And yeah, in their space, and so you get comfortable being squashed yeah, by someone, and exactly. Um, but to begin with, people are a bit like, "Oh, yeah. what's going on?" I think that that that's how I felt when I started. I felt a bit claustrophobic, right? Because it was yeah. like people were getting into your personal space, and even even worse than that, they're way too close. And then you know, one minute goes past, you you get choked out, and you think, okay, this is this is different, right? This is this is a different different sport, yeah. different game. No, it's it's good, and like you know, and I still get 
you know, some of the bigger guys, if they're on top of you and, and inside control, um, and it's, you know, those press, there's times where there's pressure on you and you've got to like, you got in your head, it's running through my head. I'm like, am I going to tap to this? And I think I, you know, and you go, no, I'm going to ride it out. Yeah. I'm thinking of Daz. Daz knows there's times where we've both been uncomfortable with each other. And he, and like, I've, I've seen the time and sometimes I'll look up at the clock and go, if there's 30 seconds, I'm going to ride this out. And I think that's a good mindset and sometimes yeah, yeah. bide you, you by other just... things that are a bit rougher in life. Um, if you can hold your breath and just dig in for a little bit longer, yeah. maybe you have to tap at the end, but sometimes you're like... You learn when to tap, right? Yeah, exactly. You learn when to tap by sometimes maybe tapping a bit too late. <laughs> but I've noticed that, in you know, seeing your journey as well like when you know you used to tap to these things and then all of a sudden no and this is no, it doesn't yeah, work anymore ride it. and then i'm like looking at myself but trying to work out what's going on and then because you think everyone's going to stay the same i think and i you, even if you're getting better you know the gap but the gap changes and it gets closer and closer i think that's the that's the difference uh, it's crazy because um what i've noticed in in our club where we trade at, at we get better, right? The, we are that advanced belts, but also the people that are beginners and they, they've been doing it for a while, they start to absorb even the things that we mm. have to our advantage, the things that we've learned during all these years that we've been doing it. Um, they absorb that real quick just because we can share it differently. You know? Yeah. We, we sort of like adapt to what we know and they, they, they just see it and they adapt to it and they're like and they, oh, they just okay. take it right and then at the same time they train with us yeah so i train he trains he gets better i get better but then he gets my things too yeah so and he's that's, like okay and they talk about that in introduced community people sharing their skills because it's almost like if there is someone who you can tap out to begin with at will the, the, you don't it's not fun there's no reward to that so you're like i might as well teach them or share some knowledge and then they can and use it against other people but then and then it like you say it forces you to then go back to the drawing board and research try and find out what can i do now to step it up one one level higher um and it's that rewarding feeling when you get to share your things when you get to actually teach someone your yeah. moves and your techniques right it's that rewarding feeling no it is good um and even if you could yeah and they just and you see them use it as well if you yeah in another role yeah they you know tuck their arms in whatever it is and then frame you, yes and you're like oh, that's my go. guy yeah <laughs> um but let me tie this back to to your to your professional career as a teacher how is how is that how does it feel to to teach the kids how what's the reward coming back to you um there's a couple, oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, so I like, when I teach, um, leading people along a logical conclusion. So, you know, you give them a bit of information and sort of ask them, what do you think is going to happen? And, you know, you get any sort of answer. Then you give them, you know, you fill in a bit more information and they re it's most rewarding when they reach that logical conclusion themselves. I think it's, I think it's called like Socratic method of ar arguments where you, there's two things I'm saying there really, but like when you, bring someone round to your point of view by giving them information and letting them reach that conclusion by themselves. And that's quite rewarding. And then when you see students able to apply that to new situations, um, and that's why exams are, exam papers in, bi in biology are often, there's a new situation, but it's based on the topic they know, but a new uh, scenario. Uh, and then you, you're trying to instill into them a way of approaching it every time that they get the right conclusion. And that's, and that's the reward is when they can start doing it themselves. And what actually, what I find really rewarding is at the A level, the top end, yeah. where they realize they don't need you as a teacher anymore. And it's a bit, it's a double-edged sword because you feel like that you want them to rely on you for like guidance and you know advice on this topic. But it's actually quite nice when you see them just sort of break away and they're independent now and they can go and do it themselves. And that means they're ready to go into university or study wherever they want. Um, so that's a really good feeling. Um, but sometimes it's tough because some students don't want to learn what you've got to tell them. Um, you know, when we're young, we're all a bit um, stubborn and, you know, someone could give us the greatest advice and we, we don't take it on board. So um, that's that sometimes can be a bit of a challenge, challenge. But, you know, the other end, when people come out and they're like, oh, I appreciate what you did, you know, you helped me here and you guided me a little bit. 
um yeah that's probably the most rewarding bit do you have um <clears throat> a strong connection with your with your um students is your students coming back yeah to no see you? you get you get occasional students coming back um i've got uh there's one who's who's gone on to do medicine finally and i remember pulling him aside in um his first year at as and um i was like he'd done badly on a test and i was like and i'd known him since he was 11 or 10 and i said to him look you need to really pick up your game here um like cause I, i've got full faith in you and i don't know i don't know if i did actually have full faith but i knew he needed to hear that yeah and i said uh, <clears throat> I've got full faith in you. Um, you can do this. And he did work and he got his A in the end. And um, and he came back and he, you know, and he said, oh, I really appreciate that conversation you had where you pulled me aside. Um, and that's quite a crazy one to think that you say stuff and it means a lot to someone else. Um, and even if even if I wasn't sure, giving, just let, letting him know that I believed in him, helped him in some way was quite a lovely moment as well. But, um, but yeah, what you see is, to begin with, like any group of people, you don't you know them, but you, you don't build an instant connection. But then as time goes by, by the time you know finish at year 11, or, you know, GCSE, or they finish at the end of two years at A-level, you build like a bit of a relationship. Because it's not yeah. just all about me just telling them what's inside a cell. It's, it's like those little bits where you have a little bit of a joke or, you know, yeah. you have a laugh over like something, nothing to do with the topic. Um, and then, but the, that's the sad bit as well, because then they go off into the world and they're young and they're not supposed to always come back they you know they do disappear and do their own, live their own lives and you just hope maybe every so often they, they have a laugh or you know giggle to themselves and think oh that was fun when you know yeah they chat with their teacher or something so yeah how does it how does it make you feel when one of your students comes back to see you and tells you you know thank you for what you've done for me you really helped me in, in my life and I, I always feel a little bit awkward because um i don't know what to say and secret is though is it's as much as they say that it was them like that boy that i was talking about he's the one who put in the hard work like i saw um someone told me once that you can't rightly or wrongly you can't um an a star an a star student will always get an a star um you can maybe change one or two marks but it's about your delivery of the information and delivering in a way which is engaging that's all you can do like um they have to put in the work and yeah you can convince them and change them slightly one or two marks maybe that's over a grade boundary they go from a c to a b or maybe a b to an a but generally the a star student so when they come back and say thank you so much i feel a little bit awkward because i'm like it was you who did the work do you know what i mean so um but yeah i'm always like are they gonna then come back and have a go at me and be like you didn't teach this correctly or something as well so I think that's my insecurities more than anything else. How do you keep up with all the technology and everything that changes in, in the science world? And in, in, I think even in biology, right? As it, there's many new discoveries and, you know, the science itself evolves as the time uh, goes on. How do you keep up with it? I think um, you try and watch a lot of videos on YouTube. The internet is just amazing now. Like if we'd have had that when we were at school, I think it'd have been completely different. Um, but you keep track by just seeing... Um, you know, YouTube, my, my subscribe videos, they always pop in with new things. Um, and also, I think teachers many, many years ago used to be like a monolith. They, like, they know all the information and you can't ever um, correct them because they've got the, the textbook. But now I just have to be a bit open-minded and, you know, a student will come in and tell me, oh, do you know what? They've just used stem cell therapy to treat a dog that's got um, diabetes. I'll be like, oh, okay. Let me have a look at it, pull it up in front of the classroom, share the information and little things like that. Um, it's never like you go to a source and just watch it. It's always like someone approach you and say, oh, hang on. Um, there's this bit of information and you've just got to be open to it. And um, Exactly. And if a kid asks me the question, um, sometimes I've got to admit to them, look, I don't know the answer to that. Let's Google it together. Let's have a look. Let's do some research. That's is, very nice. Is the research source correct? Like you can't just go to... Um, I don't know, but you know, a throwaway website. Let's let's see. Is it Roy? Real facts, facts. A, a fact-based website, and that's the thing. That's a big challenge for the kids today. Learning where where their facts come from and checking is the source reliable, rather than just taking the information. They still haven't built that filter where they can filter through bad info with good info, and they can just sort of make their mind of what's good or what's bad. Yeah, right? and it's so difficult now. Like, it's a real challenge, and with um, 
AI getting involved, I think that can have a massive effect as well. I really like your approach where you said you are open with your students when they come back at you and they said, what about this? And then you said, I don't know, let's, let's find out where back in my time when I was in school, if that was the case, the teachers back then, you know, I'm not disrespect to them. They, their time was their time, right? They, they have their own way of doing things. But if you come back with different facts, you take them out of their bubble. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, no, this is how the manual says you follow this. Yeah. And this is like a 20 year old book that you follow, right? It's the rule. <laughs> yeah. There's ancient Egyptians did this, yeah, exactly. you follow this, but I think you know, you need to evolve and, and your approach to teaching is, is interesting because you allow that, you allow people to bring their own facts and analyze that together. That's a very good, good. I think, I think it also stems from like insecurity as a teacher because you think the, these kids come in, they, they want to ask you everything and you've got to know everything. Yep. Uh, but it's just insecurity. You don't want people to think you don't know everything and then you've got no answer for it. Um, and again, relating back to jujitsu, if you ask Mark, Mark might say, I'm not sure about that, but I can find out or go and speak to Martin down at Rygate. Um, or equally, if you say, Mark, here's a, here's a move, he'll be like, oh, that's a good one. He'll let you explore, but not be too defensive about it. Yeah. And I think um, that's, yeah, helpful. And don't, yeah, it's insecurity. I think it's insecurity because I know teachers, some teachers are still like that. They won't be rigid but it's too dangerous the kids have got laptops in front of you yeah they've got access to all the information i can only hold a little bit in my brain at any one point so um so that's something that you always keep in mind you always feel insecure with the information and everything that flows around yeah because it's there's so much out there and i think i think i'm also scared of me being really confident about a statement saying there are you know something ridiculous there are no dogs with three legs and then the kid types up how many dogs are there with three legs? There's 30,000 dogs in the UK with three legs. And yeah. all of a sudden then now I look stupid because I was, I was trying to make a, an absolute statement and, and now the kids will be like, oh, what about other things you say now? Are you absolutely sure about that as well? So yeah, you've got to show them that you're not perfect and, that, yeah. um, and they'll respect that, I think, um, as opposed to trying to blag it all the time. Definitely. And I think that, that helps you to, to evolve, right? Because you you, you're not stuck in your own ways. So you're... You're open to everything to to in order to grow you need to be open to new information to come in right exactly and so so 15 years of teaching right i think so so let's think what well, might be longer i always hate counting so i started teaching training in 2005 first teaching job 2006 so what's that wow it's almost 20 years two decades that's terrible that is that's a long time. Time really? flies. Time does fly. You're doing good. And that's what, and then, yeah, jujitsu again, when I see people wasting their time not turning up to training, you know, you're like, oh, you see these young ones come and go. Yeah. I'm like, you're missing out, guys. Stick with it. Stick with it. <laughs> because if you stick with it, you'll be belted up in no time. Yeah. You just got to keep that consistency going. But um, yeah, people got their own journeys, haven't they? Anything. Well, you, you have your own choices, but I think, yeah, Martial arts for any sort of individual is a is a is a must, especially now where, at least in my opinion, people are pushed and they get programmed towards online. Everything is online. All the meetings are online. Yeah. And you sort of don't have that human connection, and then you go into like a jiu-jitsu environment, and it's too much human connection, yeah. and you might feel a bit uncomfortable or. You might just ride it and then you get to evolve with it, right? Yeah. But it's so important to get out there and experience life as well. Um, someone put up a quote, I think it was Daz saying that you'll fear death more if you aren't making the most of your time. Exactly. And like, I'm paraphrasing completely. That was something, you know, something more profound yeah. than that. But it's like, do you know, open yourself up for experiences. Um, when you asked me about coming on this podcast, you know, immediately I was like, oh, anxious, you know. Yeah. With everything with me, I'm anxious. And then I'm like, well, give it a go because what's the worst that can happen? And I'm experiencing them out. We're making a connection. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to me just sitting at home, you know, watching TV or texting you. This is much more fun and just interactive. And Yeah, yeah. It's very rewarding to, to meet people, to meet people that are, especially for me, someone that I look up to and someone that has good information to share, good good thoughts, right? 
it's, it's a very good, well spent time, right? Yeah. Man. <laughs> well, I um, appreciate you saying that. But I always feel like, you know, with me and you, we're feeding off each other quite a lot. As yeah. Well. Like, you know, you'll talk to me about stuff at Jiu-Jitsu and say, no, you know, this isn't working, um, which I always appreciate as well. Like, sorry, I always bring it back to Jiu-Jitsu. That's, that's, that's okay. That's okay, man. It's, it's something that we, we both have in common. It's something that I think we, we both enjoy quite a lot. You know, Jiu-Jitsu is, is what we do now. It's, it's probably, at least for me, it's one, I don't even know if I can call it a hobby no more. What is it? The jiu-jitsu. Is it past hobby, is it? Yeah, I think it's, it's more like part of the life, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's you. It sort of does define you, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, not like define you completely, but it's like... It, it, it's sort of, it's sort of, because now, now you just go around and everything that you do, you sort, you sort of relate to jiu-jitsu and then you think about, you walk around and you think about a technique and it, yeah, it's so yeah. much part of you now, right? And I, even with my little ones, um, I do. I have tried to get them down to do it. Um, but like, if we're wrestling, I'll be thinking about, it and I'm trying to like position them in ways that they they start to like think about how they might, you know, react if they were sparring. Um, but no, it's good. I think like yeah, you were talking about doing catch wrestling last night. Yeah, it was it was a tough session, man. We did um, some sweeps on the floor. We did some some. Um, Guillotine, guillotine defense. I think you're not going to enjoy that because when you come back, people are going to be defending you. I know. A, a little trick, man. <laughs> I, I can't tell you, but you, you will see. You. <laughs> All of a sudden, my moves don't work anymore. No. And then, um, and then a proper catch wrestling round at the end of it. I lost because I, I wanted to go. I, I went on my back and... Um, I went for a, uh, a kimura, my my speciality trying kimura, either bait to flip them or submit them. I yeah. don't think I was far from submitting him, but my my back was on the mat. That's the thing, different rule set. Yeah. And with jiu-jitsu, like one of the guards or is playing from your back or yeah. playing. And so as soon as you, and we must have had that trained into us over the last four or five years. So yeah, to suddenly switch that off and not be able to go to your back. You just, you go for the thing that you do automatically. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you think, oh shit, I can't do that. And then you try and adapt and adjust. And then you're like, ah, oh, it's a bit too late now. I might try and do something else. And it just messes up your mind. It's almost entirely. like, yeah. It, it takes you out of that bubble. And you're like, ah. And then you're thinking again like a beginner. Yeah, exactly. I felt like, like a beginner. More than just I felt like, like a low in it. Yeah, no, it, when we've done a couple of things with catch, you know, I've always struggled with it. Like, um, and it favors the big guys, whereas I think jujitsu, there's you got something in favor if you're a little bit smaller. Like, yeah, you know, everyone says if you're stronger and bigger, you're gonna have an advantage in any martial yeah, art. Yeah. But there's sometimes with jujitsu, you can be the smaller guy. You know, as long as you have got the right positioning, you can exactly. work with it. So yeah, that's that's the whole magic. I think that's what got me to like jujitsu a lot because he's. At some point, you will realize that it's more of a mental game mm. where you start seeing moves and baiting people to do certain things yep. and attack them from a different angle and so on. There's not that much of... a. F it has a f sort of physical aspect to it, right? Because you're going to get tough throws where you have to turn the volume up, right? But you never escape the strength. Exactly. You know, sometimes you have to get use it, but... And then at the same time, you get people like Nick. Yeah, There's no strength involved. That. There is no strength involved. And you still, you muscle him up and then he still flips you over. And you think, oh, how, how did that happen? And he uses his force very precisely. Yeah. And like all of a sudden, he sweeps you from, you're from fairly dominant position. He'll sweep me from side control, top side control. And you're like, how did you do this? But then again, he'll then sit there and talk to you, talk you through it. And then you're like, okay, now I can work with this. One thing I'm going to add up with Nick that, that got me is the fact that he tells you what he's doing. <laughs> you know that he's about to do that, but you still can't stop it. Yeah. You still can't stop it. And it's that sort of, like a, like a guy with his bow and arrow, right? It's going to shoot the arrow precisely right to the bullseye. That's what he's using his energy. Yeah, yeah. Straight exactly. to the bullseye, straight to the point 
that he wants to get to, right? It's a very interesting, Nick is a very interesting individual, man, as a, as a jiu-jitsu guy. And I think, um, I'm not sure if you agree, but when he came, it was a shock for most of us. Yeah. It was, I remember everyone, when the, uh, I was a blue belt then as well. So whenever, whenever someone comes in with a higher belt, you're like, oh, what, what's going on here? There's, <laughs> it was like magic surrounding them. Uh, and his stature, he's a bit smaller. But it's ferocious still. He's yeah. ferocious and technically sound. But I think he's got a few tricks up his sleeve still. Yeah. That he's keeping from us. But we'll get all <laughs> work it out slow. We just gotta pull it out. Of it. Yeah. Um, we just let him do his thing and then we just analyze and take it away. <laughs> yeah. And I found that with any um there's a new guy who's joined as well, Bluebell. He um he comes down once every uh week. in the evening. In the evening. The big tough guy. Yeah, he's yeah. Max Army, massive. But, you know, what you do is you're sort of watching him from the side of your eye during rolling and you're trying to see what he's doing, just trying to work out. <laughs> uh, a little spy. <laughs> yeah, well, and he's tough as well. Like, yeah, he's, tough. he's tough. And I'm like, tough. and that's what's up. All, all the blue belts at the club aren't like big, a tough blue belts. There's no, no one who's like, so I don't feel like I'm a, per that's why I don't feel like a perfect belt is because I feel like I struggle with every single one of them. Yeah. And everyone's, you know, it's a battle, every single one. And I, I think that's good because we don't get the belts as regular, I think, as other clubs, perhaps. I think some other clubs, they give it out a little bit more frequently. But when you've got it, think, especially a blue belt, you've earned that. Like, you you put in the hours for that. For me, the way I was looking at it for, for quite a while now, I was looking, okay, I got, I got a blue belt. It's yeah. not striped up. But I'm not a blue belt as a skill. I will identify myself as a blue belt when I'm four stripe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the time I get my purple belt, that's when I'm a blue belt. That's when realistically as a jujitsu journey, for how complex this that's whole good, thing is. Yeah. When I'm nearly to go into the next step, that's when I'm a blue belt. Yeah. So maybe that's how I feel is he's only like I'm just a, a beginner purple. Yeah. But I feel what that's why I feel still more blue belty. Yeah, yeah. Um like you say, if I got stripes on my purple over time then maybe I'd feel more comfortable in that. I think that's, that's again, with your mindset and how even you, going back to your teaching, you're still open to new things. You're still open to be wrong and to be right in certain areas. Um, even jiu-jitsu, right, where, yes, you are a purple belt, but yes, you still have loads to learn, right? So oh, you're wow. still not cocky Sorry, about it. You're still open. Yeah, I'm just aware of that there are, massive gaps in my knowledge with jiu-jitsu even as the so-called purple belt um there's a lot of gaps that like foot locks ankle locks um we'll get back to that all of that <laughs> like and i know because i knew you went into the deep ashen stuff and i was like there's a lot here that i don't utilize necessarily and i know at some point it, it's going to come around and i have to yeah deal with it it's just that it's you know we fall back to our comfortable things so I like playing, you know, taking the back, rear naked, bow and arrow. But I know that I should be pushing myself towards Ashy and like um, things like that and De De Heba. There's always a time for it, right? But at the same time, because you, you, you've you got your things that you do and, and you're good at it, right? Yeah. And then that gets you through all these, all these roles where you start mastering your style. And yeah. then whatever you add into it, you add into it because... At the end of the day, so many different options out there. You can't master them all. You're going to have a basic understanding of most of them. Yeah. But you're going to have your game, right? What you do now is probably what's going to take you to your black belt. And it's just going to refine that to that point, right? Yeah. And I also think, again, my own insecurities are, if I'm going against a particularly tough white belt or blue belt, um... I don't want to experiment too much and this it's the wrong mindset yeah because i'm worried insecure i'm insecure about my own belt do you everything. think do you have that in mind where you think oh i i cannot be tapped by a lower belt yeah and i have to check myself i have to check it a lot and when i do get tapped i have to be like that's good for you because you were thinking you were better than you were yeah that you can't you and you can't be tapped by someone and but the truth is Everyone's going to catch you. Everyone's going to catch you. Yeah. Um, and it's going, you know, you just got to learn. Cause, and, you know, because everyone talks about having no ego, but I think we all do. We all and, do, yeah. And we're all like, ah, oh, 
can't let this but then but then you're just not have to keep it in check right yeah just have to keep have it in check. healthy well yeah and be like all right maybe competitive but um but then you know like you say if you go against some white belts there's no point in you and so then you know if you go get some of the girls as well if you this is really tough is to take all the strength out of it and try and do just technique and i tell you you will struggle like if you because that's you know there's people like tori fiona if you just if you take your strength out of it it's very difficult they'll start smashing you yeah they're um tough. they're quite ferocious <laughs> um and you're like oh i have to just use my strength a little bit just to maintain control and yeah and so that's a mental game as well so exactly um exactly but again if you 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 think oh if you have a a visiting black belt like Rich, does he see you that you're struggling with a, a white belt? Oh no, all right, I've got to step up again, and yeah. you've got to again take that out. Um, I'm very glad you, you you're sharing that because I I've I felt at that a lot of the times, and then um, I had to put that to the side and actually experience the role and not worry about being tapped or not worry about the like is there any consequences of me being tapped by a, a lower bell or you know being tapped by a higher bell is fine everyone's gonna be like yeah whatever is it is a higher bell okay but even that if you take that and you analyze it from the perspective of trying to see what did i actually do wrong why did i get tapped and then then you start to grow right there's where you stack them them feelings them ideas because most of it is like at least for me when I roll with people, I have that feeling. I feel what they do. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, you can't see what they what they're planning to do, and you know how the role goes from like someone outside or someone from the sidelines. You can't see like them, right? Yeah. You feel you have that tactile sensitivity, right? And then when I feel that, okay, they're going for it, and now I'm analyzing. I'm going back a few steps. What? How did I get here? What is actually gonna happen from now on? If I'm just going to be tapped, I might as well understand why. What you did wrong. Yeah. How do you think about while you roll? How do you analyze your rolls? Um, do you know what? It's more for me after the roll that I analyze it. Um, I saw you, you did this. You brought your journal to class and you're writing down afterwards. Um, I used to have a spreadsheet on my phone and I'd take five minutes at the end of each session and I'd type in who I went up against and I'd be like, what they did well against me. And I was like, what could I stop? Or how, how can I counteract it? And that then led me to a YouTube search. How do I stop Charlie floating on me with knee and belly? Or how do I stop his knee and belly without um, giving my arm away for a Kimura sort of thing? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, it's about reflection. Whereas I think sometimes if you, and you can, I've been there, you go into the Monday night sparring and you're just fighting and that's all you're doing fighting and you might win that's fight or tap someone um but if you don't reflect on it you're just at the same level and i've been there I've, I've, you, for months sometimes i won't even reflect properly but you've got to train yourself to do that as well and be like right what am i doing wrong why am i getting tapped here and yet i also find quite useful sometimes if you are finding you're quite confident against someone is getting giving them more and more rope to hang you yeah so if you're in an arm bar, get, get closer and closer to them, almost putting it on, and then see how far you can get to them putting it on before you can escape. Yeah, that's 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 what I found very interesting because you you know you, your opponent is about to go to tap you, right? Yeah. You you see it happening before it does yeah. happen, and then you sort of I'm just gonna allow it. I'm just gonna play with it, and then see what I did, bro. Yeah. Be, while it's happening right because then you know it's, it's going to happen anyway um another thing that i personally have done um it was setting a particular technique that i'm going to drill but how long so let's say let's say like the ashi yeah the ashi garami with the entry i was drilling it for i think three months and then i just had that technique in mind and tried to so i knew i'm going to entry it and then from there, I'm going to sweep or I'm going to fit love or whatever lies within the, yeah, the yeah. technique. That's what I'm going to drill. And then if I get past, I get past. And then because I get past, by doing that technique, I can improve that technique. Yeah. Because everything else can happen in between. That is, it can happen, right? I don't have a control of everything else. 
but I can see what happens with this particular technique. But it's quite frustrating if you do it during a live roll, because if they do that, pass you... That is you... when you get the most out of it. Yeah, but then you get frustrated with yourself, because you can't get back, you can't almost go, can we reset back to that position? Because you might have taken you a long time to get into the right yeah. spot. But it's the, I think it's the way to do it. A lot of people say, you know, you just do a lot of podcasts and people talk about jujitsu and they say, have set goals in mind. Mm. Um, and that's why I was asking how long and you're saying three months. Uh, yeah, three months. Not just one evening, not like, I'm just going to, it's like force yourself. If you're going to be play guard, what do you do? You're like, you know, what guard am I going to do? Yeah. Stick with it for. You could probably know if you look back at it, you can see me, there was times when I was doing only ashes. There was times when I was doing only straight ankle lock. There was times yeah, when I was I doing only spider guards. There was time when I was doing only kimuras. So you can see that I was doing only one thing yeah. for a longer period of time until I got to feel different aspects of it, right? I'm still not perfect, but I still got a slightly better understanding of that move and what can happen. Yeah, rather than just sticking to close guard, you know. Yeah, because then you can go into a role and then you just... There's the un unlimited possibilities of what can happen from a role, from a guard. Yeah. But if you have one specific move, if you get passed while doing that, you know I got passed while doing this move. And so I need by to that way. adjust that. So yeah. then next time I'm going to do it differently. Yeah. And then if he passed, then he did pass because that happened. So now you start putting the pieces together, right? I was doing that with De La Hiva and um, very quickly you caught on. Because I was cutting people and I was getting to the back. You know, you do that. Is it called the Matrix or do you know which one I'm talking about? Crab ride? Crab ride. You sort of get in, but then very quickly you were like peeling the legs off, pushing them down. Um, I think it's Matrix as well. I'm not sure. I, I think it's, it's like, like Matrix crab ride. But you know when you're like, I know you, crab ride is, yeah, that's the word I was going for though. Um, but when they, yeah. But then when you were like defending it, I then had to go back and try and find, and then your, your search becomes more difficult. It's like, yeah, how do I continue with the Dilheba when they've stripped off the grip? Do you know what I mean? Then you get it's adding on, and yeah, and it's hard to find these things. So, um, and also instru instructionals to find these things are very expensive. Yeah, like because it's it's the fancy thing now, isn't it? Yeah, there's what the the big names, all the Golden Ryan, Gordon Ryan, what's them? And I'm like, Gordon Ryan, obviously the best person to learn from. But, but is it instructionals? Cost is it though? Is it? Is it the best person for you for you to learn? That's that's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, well, there's I've heard, I've read a lot of reviews and you know it's this thing I'm very tempted to buy it, but it's like two hundred pounds or one hundred fifty pounds, and that's stopping. That's that's a barrier. It's, it's almost too high. But then I'm like, well, then the question is, how serious are you about your jujitsu? But I'm like, I'm serious about it. But two hundred pounds in one go. I'm gonna suggest this one. It's literally. Recently, it came up. It's another guy that I really like. Um, um, he's a black belt. It's Jordan teaches jujitsu. Yeah, love it. Yeah. He released a new product now, which is a. Um, oh, man. He does inj prevent is injury it? in the mats. He does. Yeah, but then mm. now he got uh, jujitsu theory. Yes, yes, yes. And it's just $99 or something. Yeah. I was looking at it, I was like. He's That's very guy. tempting. He's a good one. And you could, there's an email. There's a weekly email that you, well, yeah. he says weekly. That you hit or miss for that. Yeah, Jordan does teaches jujitsu. Is a good He's one. He's great. He's great, yeah. man. He's great. I really like um, what I was learning from him. I really like because he goes into the, um, the principles of things. Yes. There's no tricks. There's no, uh, you know, yeah. magic pill. It's, you need... Frames, you, you need, need feeling grips, arms, you yeah. need grips, you need this and that in order to go to any other positions. So I, yeah. I really like that. He's sort of like John Danaher on positions and principles and ideas. Yeah. He's... But it's not, it doesn't get you to sleep. Yeah, that's the thing with Danaher, which is fantastic again. We're very hard going if you're trying to sit there and like watch it for an hour. You could be stiff. Yeah. You'll... Yeah. It's the best, best episode to go to sleep on. Yeah. The plate in your ear. And yeah, man. It's legit. And he obviously knows what he's talking about, but he's just... And if you're serious, you'll do it. You'll sit down, you'll force yourself. But you want to make it fun as well. You don't, that's the thing. You want. You I never want jujitsu to feel like it's not fun as well. And at times it's tough and rough and hurts. 
But at the end of it, I always leave feeling like I've had fun. Sometimes I don't, but most of the time. Sometimes you go know, the drive back home with the windows yeah. down <laughs> in silence. There are so many of those ones as well. And I don't, and I'm, Daz is going to put that on the uh, WhatsApp group. But mm. there, yeah, a couple of them where you, yeah, you leave and you're thinking you're a bit angry. And I was thinking, it reminds me, I think sometimes, you know, um, Michael Jordan in The Last Dance. Yeah. He'd cre create scenarios that someone's wronged him. And I think we do that occasionally. We're like, that person tapped me out. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to come back and get them next time. That's uh, the competition aspect of it, right? Yeah. And that's fine, I think, as long as you're not go then going when you see that person, he's not, not trying to rip their head off. Yeah. You just use it as motivation to get better and, mm. and like, all right, okay, I'm not going to let. Charlie get me with that Kimura next time or Alex with that Kimura and um yeah definitely it's a it's a very interesting to look at it that way because I think a lot of us we we have that thought at the end of all the rounds at the end of the day you did your your session you get tapped out by you know people and you go back home and you think ah I'm gonna get him I'm gonna get I'm gonna, he's not gonna get that on me I feel, I feel that way a lot of times, a lot of times. But I try and take a step back and but, yeah, just he, enjoy it. Use it as a learning experience. Yeah. Okay. But he's not going to get me with that move. How do I, how do I not, how do I prevent that happening? Stop leaving my elbows out so wide so he can grab him and like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like I say, it's harder now with everyone getting better because I know that everyone's doing the same. Everyone's doing their own research at home. Yeah, that's, like, even, even that with the own research, I've stopped. I've stopped watching YouTube videos. I stopped watching the Instagram reels with fancy move and banana splits and all that stuff. I've stopped, man. But there was a time when I felt like I need to watch all of them. And I was watching so many. Yeah. And I thought I'm learning, but it was, I think it was counterproductive because I didn't get the principles, the basics. It was an overload of yeah um, moves. Exactly. So yeah. I was learning all these fancy tricks and, you know, but I couldn't pass the guard. Yeah. Or, you know, I couldn't hold someone inside control for a long long period of time. So then you think that if I can't do that, then how can I do a fancy, you know, bow and arrow? I think animation? that's the journey though, isn't it? That's the journey yeah. jiu-jitsu is you go through this phase where you're like, oh, and you start trying to collect moves, but you can never remember them all. You get to that feeling where you feel like a like a kid back again, isn't it? Where you you like all these fast, flashy, yeah, and you have all these techniques and all these moves, and oh, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. Yeah, and you start, you know, trying to learn everything, but at the same time, the shot, yeah, you can't, way. yeah, you can't catch everything. You just have to take put one step in front of the other, and but that's so exciting when you see a white belt come in, and you're like, oh, you've got that ahead of you, that bit where you're thinking about it all the time. And it was, you know, like, you're like so obsessed with it because you're like, oh, this. And then, you know, and you know, they find out, oh, they find Jordan teaches jujitsu or they find. <laughs> and you think, I don't have that edge no more because yeah. they know about T Rex arm. But it's so fun. Like <laughs> that bit where you're like, you know, you buy a book on it, you're reading a book on it. And then, um, like you say, I don't collect as many moves anymore, but I do like principle based ones. Um, and also just rolling foot, a commentary of rolling footage. Um, there's a guy I found called, I think he's called Mega Rolls BJJ. And he does like a handful of videos. He's a brown belt, big guy. and uh, But he just talks through his what he's doing and he's very playful with it. And it's the commentary now that I'm enjoying, not the... Not the technique side. Collection of, of moves. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do like, again, people sending me occasional clips of moves and I'm being like, oh, okay, that might be something um, I can use. Because they people start to know... Mm. If there's a if there's a collar involved, oh, I'm, I might like that one. So, um, but yeah, commentary I found of rolling. But yeah, I've got, I feel like I've got to step up at some point and bite the bullet and get this Gordon DVD because I think he's got. I think he might have Danaher's principles, but in a more palatable fashion. He's still very technical with his terminology, but I think it's less put you to sleep than John Danaher. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, so I've got to bite the bullet. I think at some point. I don't know, man. Just. Maybe this is the perfect time while I'm not doing it. <laughs> it's just sit at home and read and re research as much as possible. But yeah, I think you, you would definitely get some value out of it. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. But it's nothing. You, you still need to apply it in real, exactly. in real time. You need to drill it. You need yeah. to focus on that 
move for a longer period of time and and just and just drill that isn't it because you can buy all the instructionals out there and watch all of them in a weekend but it doesn't mean you it doesn't mean it. you you become a you know coral belt yeah exactly <laughs> it doesn't make you it's you not know that instructional. so on to your gear exactly yeah. exactly that's that's another thing with, with jiu-jitsu is that it is no it's no like I can have this pair of boots and it's going to make me faster on the field. There's none of that. Yeah, you're either good at it or you're not good at it. But there's that thing where you like buy geese. You go through that phase where you buy geese, you buy new rush guards thinking it's going to give you some extra power. I still love the rush guards, man. <laughs> yeah, I do love the rush guards. But then I've, but I've been less and less tempted by them, if you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. But there was a time where I caught, oh, if I get a nice... Uh, Superman one. I'm gonna be Superman. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. You think it's gonna spill over into a game, and you're like, exactly. okay, still getting tapped out with yeah. like exactly fancy clothes on. So, but tell me, there was there was a time, and I still I still think now. I'm gonna be honest with you that you see how the um, jujitsu starts to become more mainstream, and people start to know about it so much more, mm. and grows every day. You see more and more people joining. What, do you ever look back at it and you think, ah? I started earlier and now I'm purple belt. And by the time these new people start to get it, I'm going to be a brown belt and I'm going to be a black belt. And I'm, I'm so ahead of the game now, isn't it? Do you ever think about that? Um, do you know what? Like, um, I, I don't think like that because um, I think in the back of my mind, per getting purple belt was the goal where I always thought, that would be the finish line. Not the finish line, like I won't stop. My, my game plan is now, as I get older as well, is I'll just keep going. Yep. If I keep going, as long as my body can hold up, eventually in theory I could get a black belt, but I feel like purple was, I was still, I was belt chasing, I think, Yeah. in my mind. And I never maybe said it to anyone, but I was like, and I was a white belt, I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to have my purple belt, because that would feel like a level. Did you like the purple belt? Um, like, did you want it that purple belt? No, no, sorry, I meant blue belt, even blue, blue belt. Because I was like, when I got the blue belt, I was like, oh, this is a good. But then I was like, it rubs off very quickly. And then I realized I'm um, exactly the same person I was. And so it's a status symbol, it's an ego thing again. Yeah. Um, and then, then I got to, yeah, purple belt. I, do you know what? I never thought I'd get it. But I always think, I think Joe Rogan said that he thinks police officers should all be purple belts. Yeah. And so I thought, in my head, I'm maybe thinking, oh, that's a good level to be at. So I never think, I, and I can't even picture myself as a brown belt or a black girl. Yeah. I just, so I'm quite happy. And I think now that has taken away that desire to go, oh, belt chase. Because I know it's not good to chase stripes. Like, it does feel so good yeah. to get that reward. But I realized... You know, like I said, I feel like a blue belt still. Just yeah, yeah. And I realise even if, if you put on a brown belt on me now, I can go buy a brown belt and walk around. Yeah, it, it still doesn't make no doesn't difference. Make any difference. You didn't earn your skill. You didn't earn your yeah. And so I think I feel like yeah, I, I can't see myself at purple or, or brown or black at the moment. I think I'm still yeah, man. Yeah. It, it, I think right, a lot of it is just to show up, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of it's just to show up and and I think it's and do your do that. And it's this is my passion outside of work and family and I just want to enjoy and make the most of it because I do feel you know the younger stronger guys I can feel them rising a lot faster like if you look we haven't talked about Liam who's another purple belt but I remember when he was a white belt and I could get away with stuff but now he is yeah you know so my goal with him is to stay just hanging in the round do you know what I mean yeah stay alive stay and alive. get tapped out that's it like and yeah. if I do that I'm like do you know I'll take that yeah um and I'm enjoying that moment of it. I'm not think, yeah. I, 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 you know, the people who I see as black belts, you know, Martin, Rich, the whole Rygate crew, they're on just a different level to me in my mind. And I don't know if I could ever broach that gap. Well, I don't know, maybe. Still time. would win, time, time will tell. I think what they say is that most of the people that get to purple, they will get to black. Yeah, I've heard that. And, um, what do you what would you say about the, this statement where is the white belt the hardest belt to go through in jiu-jitsu i get what they're saying because it's the, the, the fear of turning up to uh to a classroom full of people so there is that one um 
The blue belt was a hard belt to get. Do you think so? They're all they're all hard for the different reasons. It's, um, no, blue belt is is one like that's a special one I think because that makes you you're no longer just an amateur. Because also when you talk to people, like, yeah, I've heard this before as well. You talk to people, oh, what do you do? I oh, do jujitsu, and they go, oh, okay, is that belt system? You're like, yeah, and what about you? I'm a white belt. <laughs> How long have you been doing it for? Oh, you know, <laughs> two years. <laughs> So that means what's going on? Are you broken? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you're not very good at this. Um, but you're like, oh my god, three stripes, you know? Um, yeah. But blue belt getting blue belt, and I, I see the change in people when they get their blue belt as well. Like, you became a leader within the the, the scout heart and dark arts jujitsu. Daz, Medi, Alex, all, all became leaders. Like, changed your attitude, and then you're like, oh wow, like it does have an effect on people, and like. All of a sudden, they're coaching and they're giving advice. And, you know, people say, oh, you shouldn't be giving advice. But I'm like, you know, it's so helpful to other people as they're learning. I mean, you know, you're not standing over someone just giving them the wrong advice. But generally speaking, yeah. everyone's from a right angle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or at least giving some support. But it, that's such a good belt, I feel like. It makes you feel really part of the team. And Yeah. For me, my, I think in my case, the white belt... It was it was tough, man. It was tough because all them all them guys were so much ahead. It was I just show up and I thought, God, this is some what's this? Is this legit? Is this some sort of karate? What is going on? Everyone in pajamas. Yeah. And then one minute in, I'm being tapped ten times by Jack, and I thought, Wow, this is what this is it? yeah. And then yeah, it was it was in it was a crazy experience. But at the same time, I thought. If these guys are white belts mm. and they can mess me up to this degree, what can what well, yeah? What can a black belt do? Yeah. And at the same time, I think because the the club itself evolves. Now looking back at it, white belt, I was doing jujitsu. Now during my blue belt, we do catch, and then we have judo and then we have some a uh, little bit of sambo and then we have all these little things implemented into it so i think that a white belt is doing jiu-jitsu white belt and then blue belt is going to be for all these other things added into it, it. Yeah. so even the belt itself that you you go through them in my case it's the game changes and the whole the whole club changes right yeah and that's a credit to mark who yeah. um you know he's changed. He's open. He'll he'll come and say, "Oh, I learned a um, a sweep." But actually, I, you know, I spoke to someone at wrestling or um, judo, and actually, this works much better. And he's open to change. Yeah. And so he's not being that monolith of like, "No, you must do it this way," um, and open to saying, "Oh, I can adapt my game, and things can be done better." And if he didn't do that, then we wouldn't have these extra experiences. And you know, Mark introduced me to so many different experiences. My first competition. You know, which I wouldn't have done if he didn't say, come and let's do this competition. Go down to Rygate, which I wouldn't have done. Um, he took me to all these different clubs. And I mean, I've seen you, you know, you've gone to different um, seminars with him, with not just jujitsu, but like wrestling as well. Yeah. Um, you know, doing things like the 24 hour roll, which I didn't do all 24 hours, but, you know, I did a solid session. All these experiences I wouldn't have had without him, you know, pushing it. And then, like you say, it evolves the club as a whole and evolves all our techniques. Um, yeah, to have more stand up because not a lot of clubs we know, not a lot of clubs do as much stand up. Yeah, because it's not, it's 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 scary. I think for us, not judo people doing us, you know, a throw is scary. It's and also, <laughs> the, you know, collision between my forces. Ribs are and the terrified. Yeah, and my so, ribs are. <laughs> if we keep doing it a little bit, you know, every sparring session on a Monday, we start with a couple of rounds of takedown. He, you know, even if we don't necessarily always fight like that because of the mats and whatever it is, but at least we're exposing ourselves to it that when we have to, when we go to a competition. Yeah. Because um, I had that. I was, you know, you guys had did a shark tag with me once for one competition and it was all takedown, all takedown. I spent months, three months on takedowns and there was a specific one we were going for. And I, but, but unfortunately, when I got to the competition, I didn't even get a chance. The guy called guards. And then you're like, oh, what's happened? But like, I was ready for it at least. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all we can do is just try and be ready for as many different looks as possible. Uh, tell me more about your first competition. How did that go? Uh, okay, so my first competition was 
Uh, it was Joker Tricks Academy okay. in, I want to say Crystal Palace. Um, went along, white belt, really nervous. Uh, I'm, I'm a terrible person for nerves. So like, I was- And the first time you ever competed in any sort of martial arts? Um, Don't tell me you did karate when you were a kid. Yeah, uh, I did Taekwondo. <laughs> I did Taekwondo, but like when I was eight. Um, and it, no. So I'd say this was the, the first um, main competition jujitsu where I was a bit with it. Uh, really, really nervous. So I get so anxious. Like I think about it for months. From the moment I sign up, I wake up every morning and I feel sick. Like, so I start to sign up later to competitions because I get no, I get so anxious and I feel sick. And I'm like, uh, and I'm looking, I'm looking at everyone. Everyone looks as tough as they could be. And they're just other white belts, but I'm like, yeah. this person is a Terminator. <laughs> um, and I fought my first round and Mark could probably correct me, but it was against a guy called Amadeus who then after that went on to get his blue belt because I was, you know, you follow it on Instagram and you see other people and I beat him. Uh, I, beat, I did beat him by, I want to say points. Yes, I beat him by points. Um, I saw him actually do a takedown in, in the previous fight he had and I copied that to try and take him down and that worked. Got him down. I think I took his back or something and then time ran out. Um, went through. It was a three-man bracket or whatever you want to call it. Second round. Uh, took the guy down. I can't remember who he was. He was strong though, very strong. Um, and again, one on points. And so I won gold, which was lovely. Um, didn't get any subs. So that was something that hung over my head. Um, that I, I didn't, you know, yeah, submit in this competition. And I think we always want to be submitting rather than winning by points. And um, so it was good to win. Um, but it hung over my head that I sort of won by default because I didn't quite finish someone. Um, yeah, so that was my first competition. So it was good, good winning feeling, but um, yeah, I wanted to come back and win my sub. Um, and then I went into, uh, going on, I went on to the English Open next. Yep. I want to say English Open, no, Sussex Open. Uh, I think I remember that one as well. And it was just me and one other guy, um, right weight, right age, and I won on points again. So I was really frustrated. Um, and it wasn't until the next competition where I finally got a submission and it was, I think, an armbar. Was it at Surrey Open or...? I can't remember. I, I feel Open? like it might have been the Tricks Academy again. Okay. In, in, and I remember getting the armbar. I put it on and I thought he was going to tap. Um, and he didn't. Because, you know, normally people normally tap as your arms out, even if it's not there. Yeah. And I remember looking up at the referee being like, is he tapping? Is he going to tap? Should I tap? So then I, I picked Mark Chat, just re readjust. So I got in nice and tight, secured the shoulder. <laughs> and I felt, and I remember feeling a bit back. So as I pulled down on his arm, I could feel his elbow, like the bounds that didn't sound right. Yeah. Um, I felt, it felt like, you know, if you've got loads of spaghetti and you sort of like, yeah, crack, I felt that, that that sound is what I heard. And I was like, and I looked down at him again and then he finally tapped and I was like, oh gosh, thank God. Yeah. Cause I was like, you don't want to injure someone. Yeah. Um, you know, cause people do say, oh, it's a like competition. Like. I don't care if it's training fine. I'll, I won't look to injure someone, but in competition, and I'm still like, no, not really. Like, yeah, you still all feel that like amateurs. We're not professionals, so yeah. it's nothing that much on the line, isn't it? You just want to live to fight another day. You yeah, wanna... just... and if he didn't know, you know. So I remember that, and I felt good about. Uh, I don't think I got silver in that competition. I think, but it felt good at least getting a sub in competition rather than winning by point. Yeah, so definitely. That's but that's a whole competition is a whole different. It's a whole mindset. different game, isn't it? Yeah. It's a whole different mindset involved into it. It's a whole different preparation to it. Um, and that one puts you out of your comfort zone massively. Yeah. Um, and there's so much benefit to people doing uh, a competition. Uh, I haven't done one at Purple Belt yet. Um, and I do, I've got, they're expensive as well to go to. And, the, you know, the whole day is spent away pretty much. So I'm hoping that they do a Guildford one soon. Um, I into Guildford, who I think there was Harry that competed in there was a uh, Surrey Open, right? Yeah, it was in Guildford. I've been there. It's nice, nice place. Yeah, good venue. Nice tournament, good venue. Yeah. Um. But yeah, doing competitions I think is good, and it's it's the type of thing where you're pushing yourself out your comfort zone. Um, and you know we can. I know that sometimes I can get well within my comfort zone. You know, yeah. I go to training. Um, I hang out, I train with the same people, they know my moves, I know their moves, but um, 
you know, it's good when Mark pushes you and says, oh, come, come to, come to Rygate. Yeah. Because doing that, you know, you're, you're just going to go against people you haven't trained with. Yeah. And that's the scariest thing. Um, and what, unexpected, right? You don't know what they're going to bring. Yeah. And if you can, if you can, if you can get over that fear, it's a good skill to take into the rest of your life. Like, can I go for that job interview? Why not just give it a go? The same way as the competition, just give it a go. Um, yes, you're going to be uncomfortable, going to be a bit scared, but it, life's about dealing with those. Yeah, exactly. Those fears and pr just getting on with it, basically. Push through it, yeah. Um, and I still have those fears, yeah. Yeah. Like I say, I'm always very anxious, insecure about stuff. So, um, but I just try, you know, you try, try and I some, I fail as well, fail a lot, of, you know, but I've got to try and got to keep pushing yourself to say, right, be uncomfortable. So you think Jiu-Jitsu has helped you adapt to harder situations in your personal life as well? I think so. Um, I think that it, it is giving you a, a, um, a guide of how to, you know, make you, we all, and I can sense it from everyone, everyone's dealt with hard situations in their life, yeah. but they didn't know that they were doing it. But this Jiu-Jitsu, I think, gives you a method to, like, approach those new situations, go, right, okay, yep, yeah, fair enough, I failed at this or something, or I was scared about something, but what do you do? Okay, well, give it a go, prepare, give it a go, and see what happens. Um, and that then helps you um, hopefully deal with those situations. And well, there's so much still that I need to work on, you know, being a better dad, um, being a better teacher, being a better husband, like all those things that I constantly need to work on because I know that, and there's no guide as well. So like you say, you use jujitsu as a, hopefully as a tool, right? What did I do wrong there? Did I, what did I, did I help create an argument? Yeah. Did I not teach my kids this method in a, in a good enough way? Okay. Right. How can I adjust that? Okay, watch YouTube. Uh, how, how do people teach <laughs> times table? Okay, maybe I'll try that method. Oh, that worked. Okay, I can. They like encouragement. They this, sometimes they like a, being told they were wrong and they need the feedback. And it's just adjusting, keep going with that. But being conscious of that as well. Even me yeah. speaking, I'm realizing, oh, I don't do that enough. As I'm yeah, saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, That's like, good. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Like, yeah. You've got, yeah. How is it to be a dad of three? Tell me tough um i see other people other parents and i see what good job they do or what perceived job that they do so daz from our club is he's a, a dad of three and i see how he behaves and i'm like man i wish i could be more like that more uh forgiving not so tough on them sometimes and you know and then it, he he makes me realize oh life's not why are we being so serious about life you know um Enjoy the time with them. Enjoy them playing. Don't worry about the mess so much. And I've got another friend who lives in just down the road. I, I watch him. And I'm like, oh gosh, he's so interactive. And then so then then I catch myself not doing that, looking up, watching my phone too much. And I should just be enjoying being in their company, spend uh, time with them, spend time with them. But not just being passive and watching TV. Like yeah, play with them. In, uh, literally, as I'm saying this, I'm like, God, you I've got to go back now and be better than I was yeah. yesterday. I was too distracted. I was too bothered with telling them off about this. Is it that serious that they made a mess or, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it goes back to even your relationship with your um, wife as well, isn't it? The, yeah. It's not enough just to be present. You need to be there and active. Interact. Interacting with yeah. with the person that you love and your family and your kids. Cause it, I, I find myself in the same position where I think just because I am home, my missus is home, I'm home, it's enough, mm. but it's not really, isn't it? I need to be there, present in the moment, not just exist. Yeah, not just be in the same area yeah. as something. Yeah. No, you're right. As, even as I'm saying this, again, I'm thinking, God, I need to go home now and make sure I act on that and not just go, okay, and then go, oh, I'm a bit tired, let me pull out my phone, YouTube, oh, yeah. Do you want to teach this? Yeah. Actually interact, talk, people play. Um, yeah, and yeah, make the most of each moment. It's hard, isn't it, though? It's hard. It is know. hard when you have all these distractions all around. Yeah, and everyone's got their distractions. Everyone's got their issues. Um, yeah. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a counselling session for me, right? No, it's, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. It's it's good to open up and, and speak. You know, it's, it's, I think a lot of us, we, we go through the same experiences, but the way we approach them, differ from person to person yeah. right father free yeah 
three is fantastic because I'm only from a I'm an only child, so I've always wanted a big family. My wife's got she's got two sisters, so they've got a biggish family, and so I always wanted that. I wanted to be around because I spent a lot of time as a child by myself. Like, um, so I wanted to feel the movement of other people. I wanted to experience Christmases where there's loads of people around. Yeah, like you know, um, playing games. You know, um, we try and there's a we do all play family cards on a Friday usually, and you know, because I wanted that experience of like, what's it like to have a brother who plays with your friend who plays Connect Four? So I'm massive on trying to play games. Game probably do it more than I do, um, but yeah, I wanted to experience that big family feel, and I'm just fortunate because um, I've got other situations where you've got friends who struggle to have kids or. They've had to go through IVF, which is a whole stressful battle for people. And so I'm so grateful that um, I was able to have three little ones. At times it's tough, you're tired. My wife does a fantastic job. She holds down the family, she's the glue. Um, How old are your kids now? Eight. So they're not two years apart, but they, the oldest one has just gone on to the next year. So she's eight, five and three. So we, I think we're coming out of the sort of like tougher zone where we were changing nappies and not getting yeah. sleep. Like when they were like, was it five three one? Oh god, that was tough. Six four two, yeah, seven five three, and now it's eight five three five three. And when we, when it's just, have, you gradually get more freedom back. The, the problems change. There's different problems, <laughs> but um, you get a bit more freedom, which is good. But what I found is, you know, there are little hurdles in life that you get stressed about, and then you pass those hurdles, and then you don't realise, and then you forget about them. And so I think that teaches me not to worry so much about the problems. So I was worried about, oh, what primary school are they going to get into? And you're stressed about it and you're worried. And then they get into that primary school and then, you, then you're not worried about it anymore. Yeah. But then it's the next one. And then, oh, will, will, will they give my sibling rule to get my youngest into the same school? Because that would be terrible. And you worry and worry and worry. And then it happens and you're fine. You're like, oh, why did I worry so much? And I need to learn to use that don't worry about so much. Every time there's a next, the next issue, uh, you know. All the way up to when are they gonna start driving lessons? Can they book a driving nice lesson, a test? You know, but yeah, yeah, it's an interesting journey, isn't it? Being a father is a very interesting thing. Yeah, um, it's tough. It's tough as well. Like I don't think I'm, you know, I'm not a completely sane person as well. So I don't know all the answers, and here I am. Am I even, you know, raising normal people? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like I don't know all the answers. How can I be responsible? But you know, you do it in time. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic experience. It's hard. Like, because you just hear it's hard, but there's reward to come to it as well. Massive rewards. Yeah. Like, all right. It's a, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, <laughs> kids, man. Kids, it, it takes you into a different, different stage of your life, right? Where you enjoy things differently and then you have different activities that you need to explore. Um, what are the things that you enjoy doing with your kids right now? What activities? Games. Um, I'm, my mum is a maths teacher, so um, cool. and so I, one of the things I think I did with her a lot was do maths. So every day we do a little bit of maths and they, sometimes, sometimes they're great, uh, sometimes they're not. And we get in little arguments, but um, I love doing that and seeing them evolve as like, you know, what, at, at some point they can't speak they can't say words and then they put words together and then they can say sentences and it's same with like the numbers that like the logic seeing them um learn how to count and that is fantastic um love watching tv shows that we discussed so there was one which went the eight-year-old probably shouldn't watch it's called traitors on bbc um it was about hidden you're, you're trying to eliminate people and you don't know who the traitor is and you've got to work it out okay it's like interesting it's a game called mafia that i used to play as well with my friends but I think I've seen that one at a lot of ads on social media with them. Like, yeah. I think. Oh, it's great. It's fantastic. But it was watching, <laughs> watching with her and seeing that she was starting to work out the little problems and things like that. So that was fantastic. Um, swimming. Enjoy going swimming or seeing them swim. Um, we, we haven't been able to, I was saying to before, we haven't been able to go away abroad because also free kids is very expensive. Yeah. Um, but we go down to Cornwall every summer. i um, seeing them getting the sea and like swim around in the sea. It's been really like could be number one thing in the year highlight of the year every year so yeah that's it i really looking back at it again i, I really wish 
um, I would have had a chance to do more swimming mm. than I did when I was young. It was quite expensive back in the day for us and then my family would not be able to afford for me to go as much as I should. Yeah. So um, I, I really think that's that's a very, very good sport for kids to start with. It yeah. develops them. And yeah, skill that you need just in case. Yeah. Like the, I've fallen off a canal boat once and I just know that if I hadn't been able to swim, I would probably drown. How did that happen? <laughs> Tell me more. We were in a lock and the canal was, you know, like the canals, what they do is they, they ride, they have this lock to where your water rise, right, yep. to rise the boat up or drops them down. And I was at the back steering the boat. It's stationary. Um, but the, the mooring rope to keep the boat in, mm-hmm. just, somehow it just went behind my leg. And as the water rushed in, it caused the rope to come taut. And it straightened and it flipped me. Oh, wow. Legs over my head, backwards, um, right by the propeller. And I just, like, this could have ended in so I could have banged my head, knocked myself out, and died in a canal which had been full of rat and yeah, waste and not a very glamorous deck. Um, and I remember just being able to, natural, I could swim at that point, and, uh, but I couldn't swim until I was 13, which was, okay, or I should have learned much earlier. Yeah. And it, the only reason I could do it was my friends, we used to go to the swimming pool, the local swimming pool, and they would, they dragged me into the deep end and went down to the bottom and I touched the bottom and I got back up and it was like, almost like a switch. Like I'd been trying to swim for years before that. But it was knowing that if I couldn't swim, I could drop to the bottom and push myself up. Yeah. And as soon, soon as I worked that out, I could swim. It just, it was the weirdest switch. And then all of a sudden I could do lengths and wherever I needed to do. So really weird one. Yeah. I am still afraid when I go anywhere and I can't touch the bottom. I still feel that. But yeah, I still feel that you have that feeling in your chest. Oh, yeah, I've done that stomach. It's just like, I can't feel it. Well, I know I can float. I know I can work my way up to the right. top. But if I can't feel it, like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable. It's a very interesting. I, I really wish I would have get more comfortable with swimming when I was a kid. So important to do. That's, very important. Like, yeah. That's a very important skill to have. Yeah. Tell me. What is your advice for someone that wants to start to become a teacher, um, same as yourself? So, uh, oh gosh, uh, see if you want to do it. I think that's the same with any profession. I know a couple of people in different professions and they say like, you know, cause we're all taught or told that we, the profession we've got to love it. Yep. And I don't think, I don't think everyone's fortunate enough to necessarily love their job. You can enjoy it. And as long, and I think that's good. As long as you're enjoying it, if you're hating it, I think you've got to try and find something else that you don't hate doing. Uh, but see if you enjoy it and see if you're comfortable speaking in front of people. Um, because that can be quite intimidating. Um, I have to sort of put on an act every time I'm in a classroom. Like, I don't feel, I'm not naturally good at talking to a gr- group of adults um, or even just a group of people. So I have to put on a bit of an act. Um, so that that's one thing. So see if you're comfortable doing it. Um, and then see if you can get some practice as well. And a lot of schools are open. If you say, you know, you pass DBS checks and, or you've got some contacts, friends, um, you know, see, go in and have a look at it and see if you want to do it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not always fun as well. How like, did you come up with the, with the thought that you want to be a teacher? How did that come as a teacher? So I think that was in the back of my mind. And then because when I finished university, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. And I went traveling around South America. Yeah. Uh, and then I, we were just hanging out with a group of people. And then someone in the group was like, you should become, you, you'd be a good teacher. And I can't, I can't remember the situation. I can't remember what they said. But I was, but it just stuck with me. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, as soon as I got back, I looked into it. And I went, um, it's called the Institute of Education in central London. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, and I just looked into the process. And they were like, at the time as well, there was a massive shortage of science teachers. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll give it a go. They were paying you a little fee as well to do it. So it kept you going. I think I was- So you had like an move. incentive as yeah. well to do it. So it wasn't like you're just paying to train to do it, which, some, which I think you have to do now in, in some situations. Um, and I was living at home with my dad. So I was like, I might as well give this a go. Well, how come did you chose biology? What, why? Um, my degree was 
um, human biology based. Okay. So, um, I, I actually secretly, I think I wanted to be a chemistry teacher because it was secretly. Yeah. Um, but then, um, cause you can train as a sort of general teacher, uh, of science. Uh, but I think I want to specialize in chemistry because um, chemistry is quite challenging. I'd say probably one of the most debatable, but it's, it's biology is probably the easier out of the three. Physics and chemistry are quite challenging. Yeah. And so I, um, so, uh, but the, you know, the jobs open up and you apply for jobs. Um, and I started, started off in a really rough sense. Like I was not teaching anything. There was no science being taught. It was all behavior, like control and management. Um, and I was like, this, I wasn't, I felt unhappy and I felt like I was dreading every morning when I woke up, I was like, oh no, I've got to go into work. And so I was like, this isn't right. So I actually quit that job. And as I was walking out the car park, I, cause I'd applied to various teaching agencies. Yes. Someone called me up. He said, um, are you available for a job interview tomorrow? And this is like, as I'm quitting and walking out of the stall. And I remember thinking, well, if I go back to my parents, to my mum's, cause I was going to go see my mum and chat about it. Um, she'd be really angry with me if I didn't have an alternate plan. And so then I was like, okay. And so it was more biology based. So I went in for the interview, loved the school and it's where I am now. Um, 15 years later on or so. So 18, 18 years, 18, 18 was 2007, 2007. I'm, I'm, I need to speak with your, is it your mother? Yes. She's with math, right? Yes. I need to speak and my math is horrible. It's extremely bad. I always identify myself as someone that is not good at math. Yeah. But s recently I realized that it's just me having an excuse for not learning it. It's, it's I'm not bad at math. I'm just, I, I never practice it, right? <laughs> same as my foot game, my foot lock game. <laughs> um, Bye, what's funny is Jack from our club, he um, was doing a math course at Kingston College and that's where she teach. And so he was, he knew who she was. And soon, okay. as soon as he said, as soon as I said, my mum's this person. He was like, oh my God, that's your mama. Oh, now it makes sense. Like, <laughs> and then like, and so, yeah. yeah that's crazy. I, I really need some, some math lessons, but I'm, I'm extremely crap. I need to get back to basics. That's it. You're really, really back to basics. Good man. skill. Good skill, man. hundred percent, hundred percent. It evolves you mentally more than anything. I think. Yeah. Math, it just opens up part circuits in your brain. It's, it's crazy how, how it works. I can see when you speak to people that are sound with the math they will catch up things so quick is yeah it's crazy. they're working things out aren't they yeah yeah yeah. they work differently now. i'm solving yeah exactly before we wrap this up man tell me if you if there's a kid out there that's about to graduate and he's thinking to go into teaching mm -hmm. what would be your message to him what would be the advice uh Give it a go, uh, obviously give it a go. Don't always follow um, Sorry. the the rules. As in, I'm not saying be a rebel or anything like that, but people think there's a certain way to teach. And what I think is no one's right. There's no one way to teach anything. There are certain methods which yes, help you get towards a point, but feel f try, experiment and play around. Um, you know, like as much, the way I teach might work sometimes, but I'm sure there are other ways that are better. And when I talk with people, sometimes I have to help people within my department or anything. I often give them my advice, but I say, look, that's, that's one way of doing it. And I don't know if my way is the right way. So um, that'd be my advice is, you know, carve your own path, try your own thing. Like, and again, I know we always go back to our jujitsu, but there is no one way to do a pass or a sweep someone find the way that works for you um, and don't be afraid to experiment. So rip up the rules. If someone says you have to do it this way, that's probably not true all the time. All the time. That's right. So that's I think amazing. That, well, yeah, just give it go, man. Give it go. That's amazing, man. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking to you. You, you too, Tyler. This is the longest we've spoken. Not well. We were talking about a lot it's of jiu It's right? definitely the longest we've ever spoken, man. But it's nice just to, because I also haven't seen anyone for a while with my leg. Yeah. So it's good to hang out, Steph. So it's thank you. Hey, Talman, I'm looking for looking for for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> when you're when you're syndicated and there's like that's it, man. But I'm also looking forward to you know hearing your other interviews and uh, seeing who you chat to and there's a lot a lot of interesting, interesting ones coming. 
a lot of interesting ones. Looking forward to speak to all of them guys, man. It's all so many things to look forward to, man. But for me, it's exciting, man. One step in front of the other. That's it. Here we go. Thank you. Thank man. you so much for having me as well. Thank you. Let's see. I thought we were going to slap bump there and go for it a little rock. <laughs>